Right, so good morning. Is this, am I too loud? Too l okay, good. My name is Jan Piet, or JP. Many people call me JP. Um, I would like to discuss this morning uh, multiple DNS servers on CentOS. Uh, does everybody know what DNS is? The domain name system, yeah? Who of you work, actually work with DNS? I mean, all of us do, but uh, who provides DNS services? Good. Um, I'm a consultant. I mean, I've written a book about DNS, open source DNS servers. Um, I love things that work. I love DNS. I like LDAP. One of my new hobbies is MQTT. Don't talk to me about that because I won't stop. Um, and so we'd like to look at a, a selection, a small selection of open source, current open source uh, DNS servers, both authoritative and recursive. You know the authoritative server is the server that um, actually provides the original data. The recursive server is what our customers use when they type in www.example.com. That is the server that goes out and actually recursively um, obtains uh, responses. Um, so this talk is a little bit for uh, developers and admins. And I use the word admins because I suddenly realize that the word admins contains the three letters DNS. So of course, the whole thing starts off with slash etc hosts. We don't have to discuss that. Although I would like to say that very many people still think um, that it is important, particularly in DevOps areas, to deploy slash etc slash hosts files, text files. Um, if you're doing that, you're doing it wrong. Um, now, as I said, a small uh, selection of uh, different DNS servers for different purposes. Now, one very, very good tool. Who knows it? DNS Mask, written by Simon Kelly. Anybody who knows it? Good. It's uh, brilliant, particularly in relatively small environments, but also slightly large environments, perhaps a home office or small office or whatever. It's a recursive and authoritative server. It provides authoritative data out of a slash etc hosts type file. Um, it provides DHCP. In newer versions, also DHCP v6. Um, Simon Kelly, the author, is still working on it. Um, it's used in half a ton of embedded appliances, OpenWRT, for example, several home routers, several CPE uh, consumer uh, end equipment have uh, DNS mask embedded in them. Um, works on all platforms, OS X. <coughs> Excuse me, and all on OS 10, on all Linuxes, CentOS, of course, etc. Um, as far as uh, recursive servers are concerned, Unbound, does anybody know or does anybody use Unbound? Unbound, good. One, only one. I hope starting today, more of you. Um, Unbound is um, a recursive server that was created by our friends over at NL Net Labs. You will, um, uh, in the course of this talk, you'll probably uh, Realize if you didn't know already that Holland is, or the, the Netherlands, it's a particularly important country for everything that is DNS. A lot of DNS uh, products um, come from Holland. So Unbound was created by NL Net Labs. It's a recursive server. Um, it is particularly lean, particularly small, blindingly fast, and it does only recursion. It does not provide authoritative data. It has a number of uh, very, very interesting features. First of all, one very nice thing, especially if you're developing, uh, especially if you have it running on a laptop where you're, you're, you may be on a train or somewhere and you want particular data um, overridden by Unbound. So you would like, for example, your database server db.example.net to not be recursed, but you would like to give it a specific address. You can, during runtime, you don't have to restart it. During runtime, while Unbound is running, you can inject local data. Any type of 
resource record you want, A record, an address record, a quad A record for IPv6, a text record, whatever you like. Uh, so that's a very, very nice thing. Uh, Unbound was the first recursive server to actually do DNSSEC. DNSSEC is DNS security ex uh, extensions, which allow a recursor to, or a resolver, to validate that the data that was signed by an authoritative server is actually valid, has not been modified in transit. Um, unbound support for DNSSEC is absolute first class. Unbound uh, comes packaged as um, a tool in, in addition to Unbound, to vanilla Unbound, which can run on any size um, equipment. Unbound comes packaged as uh, something which is called DNSSEC Trigger, which is really, really cool. Anybody know DNSSEC Trigger? Valentin probably, but anybody else? Okay. Now, if you are interested in DNSSEC, uh, DNSSEC Trigger allows your local workstation, I have it here running on my Mac, for example, allows your local workstation to perform validation. And it will automatically detect whether the IP connection you have, uh, the network connection you have, or your upstream DNS resolver, for example, in a hotel, uh, hotels are particularly awful, um, will actually support DNSSEC and will automatically switch on or off, um, will warn you, will allow you to sign in uh, to a hotspot, etc. Can anybody interested, I can show you a little bit of a, uh, about that later on. The DNSSEC trigger is packaged for Windows 32, is packaged for OS X, and, uh, OS 10, and uh, I think also for several uh, Linux distributions. Uh, Unbound comes with libunbound, which is uh, basically the recursive uh, server, which is embeddable into your own code, if you actually want to do that. It is extensible with uh, Python plugins, uh, which you write yourself. So during build time, you decide whether you want Python support in Unbound, and then you can extend uh, Unbound's capabilities um, with Python plugins, for example, for monitoring, for statistics, things like that. And uh, I think I've mentioned already, it is very fast, very lean, highly configurable, um, very, very flexible. Highly suggested as a recursive server. Also from NL Labs is NSD. NSD comes in two flavors. We have uh, today NSD 3 and on the horizon is already NSD version 4. <coughs> Excuse me, NSD is an authoritative only server. So whereas Unbound is a recursive server, you have NSD as an authoritative only server. Blindingly fast, supports TSIG and DNSSEC, so it can serve DNSSEC records. Um, NSD uh, requires a configuration file, of course, and NSD has zones which are compiled, in other words, translated, authoritative zones which are translated into a binary format. Uh, basically, that's the wire format. Basically, that's the, the data that NSD will then, during runtime, actually supply. And that is why it is so fast. It doesn't have to do, it has to do very, very little uh, during runtime. Um, so it has a, um, a zone compiler and NSD, very important, uh, can act as a root name server. Uh, NSD was developed originally to provide um, a different brand, a different flavor of DNS servers for the root name servers. You, everybody know what the root name server is? Yeah. How many root name servers are there? Thirteen. Is that true? No. What's the real answer? Yeah. There are 13 what is called root installations, and each installation, they're by the way, they're labeled A through, what is it, M? Um, so A root servers.net, B root servers.net, and each of these installations uh, consists of multiple machines. Yeah, but 13 was the cor correct answer. Um, NSD4 is on the horizon. NSD4 um, version 4, also by NL NetLabs, of course, same people who wrote NSD and uh, Unbound. Um, has all of the capabilities that um, NSD3 has, plus it has uh, a very interesting feature, um, mainly interesting for hosting providers who um, very frequently on demand have to add or remove a zone. So you have a new customer comes in, 
and gets a small zone file, example.net with a www and a mail exchange record, etc. And you can on the fly, without having to recompile NSD's database, which was a, a little bit of a problem in the past, uh, on the fly you can add and remove zones. Very nice. Um, NSD4 is a bit more RAM hungry, uh, memory hungry than NSD3 was. Um, and um, NSD4 has support for RRL, which is an abbreviation that I always forget. Uh, rate resource, damn, rate limiting, um, response rate limiting. Response rate limiting is a feature that was, uh, I think, originally designed by the bind people, at least a uh, number, of, number of guys. And uh, uh, RRL, response rate limiting, allows you, for an authoritative server, to uh, limit the amount of queries uh, that it will actually respond to. So that is one method of trying to combat um, denial of service or distributed denial of service attacks. You specify that uh, from a particular IP address for a number of zones or for a particular zone, uh, only so and so many responses per second per, per time unit can actually be provided. Um, and can be quite effective. Uh, RRL, response rate limiting, also exists as a patch for bind, for example, bind 9. So if you uh, are searching for a very fast, very capable, authoritative name server, NSD4 is something that I personally would highly recommend. Bind. Everybody know bind? Probably, no? Um, careful, this is bind 9. <coughs> Beg your pardon. This is bind version 9. Bind is a full reference implementation of all things DNS. Some people have called it the Apache of DNS servers. Other people have called it the Emacs of DNS servers. Any feature that has ever been, I think any feature that has ever been published as an RFC, as a DNS RFC, has been implemented in Bind. Anything. Bind has an advantage and, a dis and uh, at the same time a disadvantage. The, uh, it can be configured as an authoritative server and simultaneously as a recursive server. Don't do that unless it's on your laptop. Uh, bind supports TSIG, bind supports DNSSEC uh, signing, bind supports DNSSEC validation when it's working as a recursive server. Bind comes with a number of uh, utilities for doing DNSSEC signing creating keys, signing records, etc. Bind runs fully on Windows 32. Bind has a quite interesting feature called SDB, simple, uh, simple database interface, where you can, uh, in the C language, write sort of a, a, a plugin, which is compiled, which is linked into, into your Bind binary, which will provide data from alternative sor uh, sources. So, for example, out of an LDAP directory server or out of a a SQL database server, etc., or whatever from whatever source you uh, you actually like. SDB uh, is a little bit deprecated because you need to compile and link bind, so it's statically uh, linked there. DLZ or DLZ, as the Americans would call it, is dynamically linked zones. DLZ comes in two flavors: the original flavor, created by a chap called uh, Robert something. Um, and a newer version, which allows also dynamic updates to be performed. Quite, quite nice, quite interesting. Uh, Bind has support for RFC 2136. RFC 2136 uh, is dynamic DNS updates. Uh, careful, when I say dynamic DNS updates, I mean real DNS updates. I don't mean things like uh, a REST interface to modify your IP address when your router reboots. No? That's also dynamic, but we're talking about um, RFC 2136 dynamic DNS updates. Anybody use dynamic DNS? Like for updates for, yeah, exactly. For example, when DHCP issues a lease, it would update the DNA, the authority to, uh, DNS zone for that um, uh, uh, for that for that zone. Yeah, exactly. That that kind of updates. Anybody use it? Yeah, only one. <laughs> 
dynamic DNS is really, really cool. Um, it's very, very fast too. If you are interested in using DNSSEC, you will almost be, well, not obliged, but I would very strongly recommend that you also look at dynamic DNS. Uh, one of Bind's limitations is it is quite RAM hungry. Um, so configured with a lot of zones, uh, by a lot of zones, I mean 100,000 zones, 200,000 zones, 300,000 zones, uh, it starts consuming a lot of memory. Also, one of Bind's uh, disadvantages is configured with a large number of zones. Bind is deaf, it will not answer queries until um, it is restarted. On the other hand, the positive uh, side of it is it is almost today almost unnecessary to restart a bind name server. The reason it is almost unnecessary is that since bind 9.8 something around 9.8 something or other, um, RNDC, the, the um, control tool of, of uh, name D, supports add zone and delete zone. So you can also, like with NSD4, you can on the fly add new zones to your server, you can remove new zones. So absolutely very seldom is it necessary to actually restart bind, basically, to my mind, basically only when you restart your machine. Yeah. Uh, bind supports multiple views, which uh, can be nice or can be horrid. Um, multiple views means that depending on which address actually performs a query, it will um, be answered differently. And that can be done by network blocks, by IP addresses, it can be done by TSIC keys, all sorts of different possibilities to uh, limit who sees what. Bind also supports uh, response rate limiting with a patch um, for, I think, all versions. And Bind supports RPZ or RPZ. RPZ is response policy zone. Um, response policy zone are zone files, which look exactly like any other zone file, where you can configure a recursive bind server to reply from answers from records contained in that RPZ zone. And by doing so, um, you can modify the behavior that somebody sees. For example, you have a, in, a, in your company, you have several bind recursive servers, and uh, you suddenly realize that um, there are a lot of queries to jp.example.net. And you also realize that that is perhaps due to some virus on users' workstations, etc. You can uh, create an RPZ zone and you can say that address should resolve to 127.0.0.1 or that address should resolve to an X domain, to no response. Okay, So you can modify the replies to a particular um, query, um, sending it somewhere else, you can answer as a C name, you can uh, re respond an X domain, etc. without touching the rest of example.com. Nice for things like uh, catching advertisement servers, nice for things like diverting queries to particular, uh, to particular things, to particular resources on the internet you don't want people to see. Um, RPZ has been termed, has been called the DNS firewall. I intensely dislike that term um, because it's not really a firewall. The only thing we're doing is basically we're lying, we're telling a lie to our clients. Our clients are asking for www.example.net and we are, for example, saying, even though it exists, even though that DNS resource record exists, we are responding, doesn't exist. Or we are responding, yeah, sure, the address is there instead of there. Yeah. So we are, it's not, to my mind, it's not so much a, a firewall, it's more like a, a lying machine, a telling lying machine, um, which is cool and nice if we use it uh, for very specific purposes within our own organization. This becomes very uncool when our internet service providers start using it to tell us a lie, okay? That's very important to differentiate. And so there's, there's quite a bit of discussion there.
By the way, if you have questions uh, in between, then please uh, shout. Um, yeah, so bind is uh, yeah full full reference implementation of anything um, that is DNS. Oh, uh, one more, uh, two more sentences to RPZ to the response policy zone. These are zone files. It's not some some magical configuration. These are zone files that um, can of course be transferred via zone transfer, AXFR or IXFR. Everybody know the difference between AXFR and IXFR. AXFR is the protocol for zone transfer. AXFR is a full zone transfer, and IXFR is an incremental uh, zone transfer. Um, so they can be shared, um, they can be transferred, they can be updated dynamically via RFC 2136 dynamic DNS updates. So that makes it really very, very powerful. That's bind nine, and bind nine's development continues, and we hope or expect, no, mainly hope, that it will continue for the next several years because there's a new kid on the block called Bind 10. Anybody heard of Bind 10? Bind 10 is a complete rewrite. Complete rewrite. It was written um, mainly as, um, yeah, as a collection of C++ and, and there's a lot of Python, Python version 3 in uh, Bind 10. Uh, it is conceptually completely different. It's not quite finished yet. There's no uh, recursive part, for example. Um, there is a D DHCP component. There's a zone transfer component. There's an authoritative, zone, uh, uh, authoritative server component. And we decide upon installation, we decide which of these components we actually want to use. With bind 9, when we install bind 9, we have everything. And a configuration file decides whether this part of this everything is going to be used or not used. With bind 10, we, uh, which is much more modular, we can decide, for example, uh, we want the authoritative part and uh, that's it. We're not interested in the ATP, we're not interested in the recursive part, etc. So these individual components can be enabled and disabled. Um, bind 10, uh, for all those who hate bind 9's configuration syntax, which is something I've never understood. How can people who program in Perl, for example, or in C, how can they hate namedd.conf for the braces? I've never understood that, but that's one of the main things I hear. I hate bind9 because of its configuration file. Well, for anybody who hates bind9's configuration file, um, you're in for a nice surprise because bind10 doesn't really have a configuration file. Um, everything is configured via a REST interface um, and lands in a SQL3 uh, database and so yeah have fun um, bind 10 the back end of bind 10 the authoritative back end of bind 10 currently has support for SQL Lite 3 so the database is not in master zone files like in bind 9 or like with NSD but all the uh, all the, the the authoritative DNS records are in a SQL 3 um, database um, will hopefully be augmented by other backends. Um, yeah, by 10, probably very interesting. I know many people who are very surprised about by 10 and uh, the way it, is, uh, it has been created and the capabilities it has, but it's something that will possibly at some stage um, actually replace bind 9. But I don't know, I cannot tell you. Um, the only thing I know is that bind 9 development will certainly continue for a few years. Don't ask me how long a few years is. Well, you can ask me and I will, I will uh, reply that's about a few years long, okay? Did you have a question? Oh, sorry. Um, not, the English word not is, you know what a knot is, huh? you tie a, a knot in a rope. It's probably a pun on the word bind, which means to tie something up, or unbound, which means not tied together. Uh, not is, 
a relatively new uh, authoritative server, which was created by the .cz um, Czechoslovakia uh, top-level domain. Well, CCTLD, country code top-level domain. <coughs> it supports master-slave operation, zone transfers, full, transfer, uh, full and incremental zone transfers. It supports, uh, since the latest version, RFC 2136 dynamic updates, which is important. Um, it has support for add zone, or it will have support for add zone. That's why it's here in italics. It will have support for add zone. In other words, adding zones on the fly. And has support for response rate limiting. Um, it's relatively new, works well. It is uh, quite RAM hungry. If you've been following closely, you will see the word RAM hungry. That means consumes a lot of memory with one plus, with two pluses, and perhaps even with three pluses. I can't remember. Um, so it's it's a little bit more than a little bit more RAM hungry for a lot of zones, of course. No? Um, why why is it important to have different flavors, different brands of DNS server? Can anybody think? I mean, why? Why would somebody have a bind oh, in, in one environment? Why would somebody have, for example, a bind and an uh, authoritative server and NSD and not running? Yeah, correct. Just to make sure that, for example, if a particular bug uh, causes um, a certain server to crash or there's, a, there's a, um, something wrong with that brand, your infrastructure continues working because that bug will prob most probably anyway not affect the different brands. So these different f brands or the different flavors of name server can uh, and are interesting for people who have large environments who really want to keep, keep running all the time. Okay, not very interesting and certainly worth your while um, keeping an eye on. Yadifa is a very new, even newer than uh, not, is also an open source DNS server which was created by the guys of URID or OIRID, that is the .eu, .europe top level uh, domain. It's an authoritative server which has support for DNSSEC and also dynamic uh, zone updates, uh, dynamic DNS updates, I beg your pardon. Um, yeah, there's not really much else I can say about it. It, it, it works fine. Um, yeah, period. Power DNS. Anybody know Power DNS? Good, interesting. Hmm. Power DNS, the authoritative portion, careful. The Power DNS uh, comes as an authoritative server and there's a separate component called the re uh, PowerDNS recursor. Okay? This is, I'm talking now about PowerDNS DNS authoritative server, uh, which is extremely flexible. Uh, PowerDNS has different so-called backends and these backends um, are responsible for actually storing the authoritative data that the server is going to uh, reply with. So it has lots of backends. The two uh, the, 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 the most used backend, probably the SQL uh, uh, backend, so in other words, for MySQL and for, for PostgreSQL, uh, followed by the so called bind backend. There's actually a bind backend which uh, serves responses from bind master zone files. Okay? Um, there are all sorts of other backends. There's LDAP backend. There's a pipe backend, which is very interesting. The pipe backend launches what is called a co-process, and this co-process is, is a program you write, which receives a query over standard input, and your program responds by a standard output, and whatever your program responds, in a particular format, of course, is what PowerDNS then actually sends out. So it's very, uh, very nice to, uh, very, very interesting for, for providing responses from alternative s sources that are not supported by a native backend. The pipe backend is, of course, slower, 
than the what is called the native backends that are linked in as modules, um, but it's, it's brilliant for, for prototyping. Okay. There's also an LDAP backend. The LDAP backend has lost, uh, unfortunately, lost a little bit of love. Um, it, it works very, very well, um, and it is being maintained by uh, a separate project, um, but the LDAP backend does not s have support for DNSSEC security extensions, which is very unfortunate. The authoritative power DNS server is probably the easiest way, and I mean literally the easiest way to get started with DNSSEC. If you're interested in DNSSEC, DNSSEC uh, DNS security extensions, in Power DNS, basically, you have to set two configuration uh, values, alter your database schema, adding two tables, and what you literally then do is say, sign this zone, and that's it. Everything else happens literally automatically. So PowerDNS will automatically then sign records as soon as it starts delivering them. Um, PowerDNS authoritative server supports master-slave um, mode of operation. So you could have, for example, um, a hidden PowerDNS master doing DNSSEC and delivering zone transfers to bind or to NSD or to Yadifa or to NOT, whatever. Um, and it supports what is called native operation. Native operation, for those of you who already use uh, PowerDNSSEC, means uh, that the replication of zones does not happen via zone transfer. The replication of zones happens in the back end, by whatever back end you use to serve PowerDNS data. So for example, MySQL database replication, or PostgreSQL uh, replication, or uh, in the case of LDAP backend, you have maybe open LDAP uh, slap T uh, replication. And PowerDNS has a very interesting feature called a supermaster. The supermaster is a possibility where you have different installations of PowerDNS, and um, PowerDNS will, upon notifying a master, a PowerDNS supermaster, that a new zone has arrived, will automatically configure that zone, will say, okay, I know that this is trustworthy, and will then bring that zone in via uh, via f a full uh, AXFR, via zone transfer. So there's a lot of work being uh, done there, a lot of maintenance work. Um, PowerDNS is really a, a wonderful tool to use uh, for authoritative data, particulars, uh, particularly since it's so flexible. For example, I know a lot of people who are very interested in updating their DNS data <laughs> more or less dynamically because they have uh, particular web front ends, perhaps because they have provisioning systems uh, in different databases. And just by updating the backend database, you are basically telling PowerDNS to supply different answers. Okay. Okay, the PowerDNS recursor is the second part. Um, many people love it. It is a completely different product. It is a recursive uh, server. It currently does not have support for DNSSEC validation, but the guys over at PowerDNS are, let's say, working on that. PowerDNS uh, Recursor has the possibility, a little bit like Unbound, that I mentioned earlier, to serve local data from, um, from zone files. It can serve, if you wanted to, it can serve the content of slash etc slash hosts, a little bit like DNS mask does. It has uh, quite nice support for monitoring and it has an embedded Lua uh, scripting engine. Do you know Lua? Lua is a very thin, embeddable um, what is it? machine. Um, and with Lua, you are able to create a Lua script which can, um, which can see what PowerDNS is going to be resolving, in other words, the query that comes in, and you can instruct Lua, for example, if a query for www.example.net comes in, then reply with a different address, a little bit like what I discussed, uh, response policy zone, RPZ for bind, you could implement with Lua. Apropos Lua, back to PowerDNS authoritative. A PowerDNS authoritative server also has an embedded Lua, you're welcome. It was a feature that I requested, my idea. And that is totally cool. Um, 
doing so, you can configure PowerDNS when it retrieves, when it um, is going to perform a zone transfer, you can pass that zone transfer into your Lua script, modify things which are then stored in the backend. So that's really, really neat. For example, for adding particular records, for example, for adding a text record, the zone was updated on now, uh, changing records, whatever. So that's, that's quite nice. Yeah, so that more or less um, covers, no, more. Uh, more or less covers the um, the scene of the open source DNS servers as uh, we have them today. Um, some of you, I know you two, might have missed something called uh, MyDNS. MyDNS was a very, very nice little product which also had support for DHCP, uh, in other words, for dynamic updates. But that has sort of more or less fallen away. There was a an intention to create a MyDNS NG, but that also fiddled out, at least according to my sources. Um, if you are, if you currently use MyDNS, um, my recommendation would be to migrate to PowerDNS, which first of all has a MyDNS backend, so it, uh, PowerDNS is capable of understanding the MyDNS MySQL database schema, um, or probably even better, try and migrate your data uh, into the PowerDNS database schema. Yeah. Any questions so far? I haven't quite finished yet. But okay. Now, what is the situation like uh, today? This uh, hopefully covers, at least until the day before yesterday, the current uh, situation we have. The, um, on the left, uh, the server, PowerDNS, PowerDNS Recursor, NSD, etc. And we have the current version. I think these are all literally up to date. I added that uh, day before yesterday, so the version should be quite current. And then I've shown you uh, what actually exists in CentOS 6, what exists, the versions that exist in April 6, and in Repo Forge. Um, it's a little bit difficult. There's so many different products that um, it seems to be very difficult to keep a central repository of things up to date. The, um, the column I've specified as external, by that I mean there are external repositories, so not CentOS 6, not EPL, uh, not RepoForge, that actually contain installable RPMs for current CentOS 6 versions and for the current um, DNS server flavor. On the other hand, as you probably know, at least as well as I do, um, it's no black magic to get a um, to get a name server installed. Configured, that's something completely different, but to get it installed is no black magic. So usually a make install would be more than sufficient, particularly if you're in a slightly larger environment where you perhaps want to make um, servers for multiple boxes, for multiple machines, um, do look at installing or setting up your own local repository and perhaps using tools like FPM. Do you know FPM? The, that's the fine, I think the F stands for fine, I'm not quite sure, the fine package manager. Fine package manager is a tool uh, written by a chap called Jordan Cecil or Cicel or whatever. Um, Unfortunately, it's written in Ruby. Uh, I say unfortunately because that means you need the whole Ruby stuff, yeah. Um, but it's, it's absolutely brilliant. You can do a make install locally and then you point FPM at that directory and you say, make a package. Yeah? And then it actually creates an RPM, a .deb, it creates a, what else, a, a targz, it creates whatever you want. Yeah? So a really nice utility for, uh, utility for um, for, uh, for for quickly packaging if you don't feel like learning how to write a spec file. And I don't. Um, right, that about covers it. If you are interested in uh, open source DNS servers, you might be interested in my book, uh, which is uh, under that URL, is uh, make that available free of charge as a, as a PDF which you can download. Uh, 
It was supposed to be 100 pages. It's over, three, uh, seven, over 730 pages. Um, but there's a lot of uh, rather neat little things in there. At least I find a, a lot of neat little things in there. So you might, you might appreciate that, particularly if you're getting started with open source DNS servers. I cover all of the ones that we've discussed, except, of course, the brand new ones, not, not, uh, not Yadifa. And um, one thing for me is important to say is it's not always a DNS problem, okay? DNS is not that difficult. It's not always a DNS problem. And if you're interested in DNS and anything around DNS, this, uh, this website, dnssexy.net, um, collects a list of blogs and a list of articles um, covered by people who also talk about DNS. Not exclusively, but also. So you might uh, be interested in that. Any questions? Yes? Well, the question is, performance-wise, which one would I say is the best? Um, let me answer that with a question. What are you trying to achieve? <laughs> Query what? Recursive or authoritative? You, that's a question that, you c that nobody can answer for you. That question depends exclusively on, on your environment. It depends what you're serving, how many zones you're serving. Are, is, do you mean queries authoritative? Do you mean queries recursive, etc.? cetera? Um, in 2000, I think it was eight, in 2008 when I actually wrote the book, uh, so it's a little older now, of course, um, the versions that I tested at the time, um, which is not, <laughs> today is not fair. I mean, those tables, th th only trust the uh, statistics that you create yourself, okay? So that's why I say the statistics that you see, that you can read about in my book are not fair because uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, four or five years time have passed now, so a lot of optimization has been done in a lot of these programs. Second of all, for example, at the time, I was the very first person to test Unbound. It was brand new. Yeah? So also a lot of water has flown down all the rivers in Europe since, uh, since that version that I saw at the time came out. Um, if you're interested in high performance authoritative responses, then in any case, my recommendation would be have a look at NSD. If you're interested in high performance um, recursive uh, responses, then look at Unbound. But authoritatively, even though NSD might be today, I, I honestly don't know because I haven't measured for years, uh, even though NSD might be the fastest, might be, um, Perhaps for you and for your environment, let's say PowerDNS authoritative server is better suited because of its backend capabilities and because of its provisioning capabilities. So even though NSD might be a little bit or even a lot faster, you might want the trade-off that the flexibility of PowerDNS uh, gives you. I can't tell you, I've forgotten. I would have to look it up. I honestly can't tell you, I've forgotten the numbers. Uh, NSD at the time was the fastest, Unbound was the fastest. I cannot remember exactly. Please look on page whatever, uh, quite at the end of the book. I, I honestly don't know. Yeah. No. The, on the PowerDNS authoritative server, the, the Lua engine, the embedded Lua engine is exclusively there, uh, or exclusively activated on a zone-by-zone zone basis upon incoming zone transfer. It's not for responding to queries, but I'm suddenly not quite sure there might be a Lua backend. I'm not sure. There might be a Lua backend, but that's a different that then would be used to provide uh, responses. No, no, um, no, not the authoritative servers. Uh, no, absolutely not, unfortunately. 
uh, a lot of the recursive servers have some sort of mechanism to change things. For example, unbound with its local data or unbound with its Python module that you can, that you can build yourself. But uh, not during zone transfer to an authoritative slave, no. Yes. Uh, Oh, okay. So, um, uh, I have a short question. You said uh, you made some estimations about uh, memory-hungry uh, DNS servers. Uh, what does uh, this exactly mean? Memory-hungry and memory-hungry plus plus. It's a memory-hungry means a real estimation. About I, I will certainly not give you numbers. Memory-hungry means that um, suppose you have a hundred thousand zones. Okay, relatively small zones. Uh, if you have 100,000 zones and you load these into, let's say, PowerDNS, PowerDNS will consume a certain amount of memory. Uh, the memory that PowerDNS consumes is not dependent on the amount of zones it serves because PowerDNS responds to queries out of its backend database. So we have a for example, a PostgreSQL database with 100,000 zones configured in it, and PowerDNS queries that database. If a, if a query comes in for example.net, then PowerDNS checks, asks its backend, do you have that? And if so, it responds. And then the next query comes in for example.org, and PowerDNS will check its, uh, will ask its backend, do you have that? And yes or the answer is yes or no. The memory consumption required by PowerDNS authoritative server is not dependent on the amount of zones. So if you have just two zones in your backend database, it will consume about the same amount of memory as if you have a million zones, okay? With uh, bind, authoritative, with not, with Yadifa, uh, with NSD, that is quite different. Uh, bind, for example, the others as well, but just as one example, bind, upon startup, will load those 100,000 zones or the million zones into RAM, into core, into its own memory. Yeah? Um, not only will it load them into memory, it also just checks, is the zone correct and is it, is it uh, syntactically okay? So all that has to go into RAM. That's what I mean by RAM hungry. It requires, it eats a lot of RAM upon start. Okay? We don't see this if you have perhaps 1,000 zones. You see this when you start having 100,000 or more zones, then you see that, for example, starting a bind takes a certain amount of time that it requires a lot of memory. Does that answer your question? Yep. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it doesn't answer your question because you asked what is the plus and the plus plus. The plus and the plus plus just means if a certain brand of name server uses so much memory, that is RAM hungry, and if it's plus, then it's a little bit more. And plus plus is a little bit more than that. There was a, uh, Adrian, there was a question in the back there. So, um, do you know the, uh, on Cisco equipment, there is a feature, Dr. DNS? Called what? Dr. DNS, a feature on Cisco equipment. Do you mean that feature that, that, uh, that translates responses? Um, it's something like um, if you're installing a network address translation rule to translate the public IP address into a private IP address, and you name that rule with test one, let's say, uh, if you are making DNS requests internally, uh, asking for test one record, it will automatically respond with the IP address that was configured. For Turn it off. Yes, it's, it's awful. <laughs> So, and but uh, it, I think it used to be called different. I didn't know that it was called Dr. DNS. I think 10 yes. years ago it was called something different. That's yeah. the very best way to shoot yourself in the foot. Yes, it, it's very awful. Both feet at the same yes. time. It's very awful to have that feature. Yeah, activated. turn it off. Okay, my question is that if there is, um, judging by the how was the feature implemented, uh, I'm asking if there is something like that in open source, something like listens the traffic and automatically injects DNS queries because it will be a different approach. Instead of having a DNS server, you'll 
you'll uh, modify directly the uh, TCP traffic, TCP IP traffic. So well, uh, uh, it will be a different approach to the. I, I hope there is no such tool, but yes, there is. Um, turn it off. Um, if we have a scenario where uh, you would have to migrate your application from one public IP to a different public IP from a different subnet, uh, what would you recommend to minimize the possible downtime? Because we have situations where the DNS, uh, recursive DNS servers are, um, are memorizing uh, the old uh, IP address, so we want to make sure that we have, uh, okay. we the migrate our application the addresses, out. The addresses of your authoritative name servers are being changed. Yeah, okay. exactly, yeah. Exactly. Uh, the solution is relatively simple. Um, way in advance, before you start, and this is very important, way in advance, you lower the TTL of the name server records. Yeah, actually, probably this is uh, a common practice, but I was wondering if there are there are more things you could do to make sure, because no. uh, it seems some of the some of the providers resolvers uh, can can I don't know can cache the zone, even if you have a lower TTL set. Yeah, well. So the, yeah, the actually yes, the of course, a recursive server, um, a, a recursive server will normally not do that, but you can, for example, in Unbound, yeah, you provide the. I'm your customer, yeah? and my provider using Unbound. My provider can say, instead of sending out queries to your authoritative servers, it will raise the minimum TTL. There's nothing you can do about that. Okay, so if my ISP, if my provider does that, there's nothing you can do about that. If my ISP uh, is using some sort of funny uh, DNS server that doesn't work correctly or where they where they lie to answers and things like that, where they have RPZ zones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's nothing I can do about it. Well, yes, I, I can, I can use my own, but um, there's nothing your customers can do about it. And even worse, there's nothing you can do about it. So the only thing you can do is, um, that's why I said way in advance, and I don't, don't just mean TTL seconds in advance, I mean way in advance, start lowering your TTL to be able to switch over. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm a bit hard of hearing. I cannot hear you. In okay. reply... Now I'm deaf. Uh, in reply to his question, not even while using DNSSEC, for, the, for example, the client, if he's using DNSSEC, can't he uh, verify and be sure that it's the right, the new answer, not the one cached by the by the provider? Um, if your client is using a validating uh, cache, a validating resolver, and his authoritative server is providing uh, DNSSEC signatures, and if that ISP starts messing about with those responses, so if it uses, for example, RPZ, then validation breaks. RPZ or any modification to the value of a, of a DNS answer, of a DNS response, will break if DNSSEC is in progress. So RPZ, response policy, uh, policy zone, will actually crack validation, will break it. So the, the, the only way is to prepare in advance and to start lowering TTLs, sign that, publish it, and have all the caches in between actually uh, rely and respond to that. Yeah? Good point, though. Um, the original question was migration of the authoritative name servers. Um, so not WW, but let's say NS1 or NS3. Or, um, uh, the, the problem with adding an additional record, uh, to, uh, that would help in terms of the actual name servers. It would not help if, for example, you're migrating the primary IP address of your web server. 
because then a client that performs a query would get two responses to the query, okay? Which is perfectly valid. It's called what is called round robin. But you cannot influence how, those rep how I get those responses. So the first connect will, uh, will succeed, the second will fail. The first will succeed, the second will fail. Uh, yes, I can try. Um, the question is, can we talk about what big nodes, uh, which brand of server they use? Well, first of all, most of the, um, the root name servers, and I would say those are big nodes. We're talking about machines, well, installations that get several million queries sometimes per second. Uh, most of those are running uh, bind, and I think two installations, two or three installations are running NSD. So, but that is a completely different <laughs> feeling than what maybe you and I or what our friends here who are hosters would have. Don't forget a top level domain, a country code top level domain, the root name server. The root name server has a tiny zone, okay? It, it gets masses of queries, but, but the zone is tiny. Um, a country code top-level domain has a very large zone. If you think, for example, .de, the German, um, the, uh, the German country code top-level domain, has, don't quote me, somewhere around 16 million uh, delegations. So times two or times three name servers per delegation, okay? So that's, we're talking about perhaps 50 million records. Now, .com, anybody know how much .com has? .com has over 150 million delegations times three, times four. So we're talking really m one zone, huge, okay? Um, whereas a hosting provider will have very small zones. Karanbir Singh dot UK, no, dot co dot UK um, is a zone which has five records in it. Two name servers, a web and a, and a mail exchange. Okay. Tiny, tiny zones, but that a uh, hoster might have half a million of those. So a completely different uh, situation. Um, on the other hand, you have the internet service providers, Comcast, the largest in the United Kingdom, perhaps T-Mobile, Vodafone, whatever they're all called. I, I don't know the name of your uh, providers here, who have uh, a lot of recursive traffic. Uh, Comcast, if I recall correctly, I'm not quite sure. Comcast, I think, uses some proprietary system. Um, but others use a combination of bind. Others might use unbound. I know, for example, that there are large providers, recursive providers, who use PowerDNS Recursor and are very, very pleased with it. So <laughs> basically, there's no, uh, there's no, there's no recipe, there's no formula for everybody. If there were a formula for everybody that would suit everybody, there wouldn't be so many name servers. Yeah? Yes? Uh, behind root 53, that's uh, Amazon's... Um, I... No. I'm sorry, uh, whatever I would say now would be a lie. I seem to remember, don't quote me, okay? Switch off the microphone. I seem to remember that it's DJB DNS, DNS cache, uh, or tiny DNS, but I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure, I d no, I don't know. It might be something proprietary, okay? Uh, Google has a, a recursive server. Do you know the uh, IP addresses of Google's recursive server? Quad eight and double eight double four. No, uh, they've written their own. Okay. It's uh, by the way, uh, Google does the NSEC validation. No? If you're interested. So 
testing is very important before going to production. So if I want to test the DNS infrastructure that is found between multiple cities or multiple continents, uh, how can I test that? Are there any good stress tool that can even simulate denial of service attacks? Yes, uh, there, 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 there are a number of uh, there are a number of tools. There's Resperf, uh, which was created by Nominum, and uh, Resperf and some other perf. There's also a tool that does um, TCP query testing, DNS queries over TCP port 53, written by Bert Hubert of um, PowerDNS, which is freely available. So yes, there are a number of tools. Um, some of them, I think, if I recall correctly, are linked from dnsxc.net, but you'll, you'll find them. There's one by the PowerDNS guys, and Nominum has created ResPerf and QueryPerf. ResPerf is for testing uh, resolvers. QueryPerf is for testing authoritative servers. And what these utilities do is uh, you provide a file with the DNS queries. So you say, for example, www.example.com, type A. Hmm? And you can generate files like that. And you launch that file against um, against those utilities and point into a particular server. And they, they will then really start throwing out queries and it will give you statistics at the end. It's quite well done. I think that concludes my time, no? Okay, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be around. Thank you.